70% of people with ADHD have another psychiatric condition. As you add psychiatric conditions to ADHD, you increase mortality rates, not morbidity rates. You increase mortality rates. And if you show up this afternoon, I'll show you that information. Um, I think for those people who look at you peculiar, it simply, remain, it, it simply means that they don't understand the complexity of what's going on. Uh, this is not their bailiwick. They don't see the patients. They don't know how to evaluate for ADHD. And so just have a conversation with them and walk away. Um, if you don't believe in ADHD, that's fine. There are still a lot of psychiatrists who say, this is just made up for the pharmaceutical industry. That's fine. I understand you fell asleep 30 years ago, just woke up, missed the explosion of academic research. Um, but if you don't believe in ADHD, that's fine. Would you send the patient to somebody who does so an accurate assessment can be made as to whether that's there or not? <clears throat> Which only means that everyone in this room is gonna have more patients because you are the people who know what you're doing. In your experience, how often do adults and kids need to go above the FDA max of stimulants for a significant reduction of symptoms? Um, so if I pulled a number, it would be from the, the ORIS, methylphenidate adult uh, titration, which is about 30%. Now, I run a specialty clinic. People who see me are looking for a certain level of expertise. So I'm going to be the, the people who are refractory or not optimally responding, and I have more patients who are going to be on higher doses. In a clinical practice, I would probably guesstimate maybe 20% of your patients need to go beyond the FDA max, but again, not cavalierly. It's because they've gotten a benefit as you've moved up, there's no tolerance developing, and so you're going up higher and higher, monitoring vital signs to ensure that as you go up, you're not gonna run into hemodynamic problems, which is another issue with people who have comorbid ADHD and hypertension or cardiac issues, which is a conversation and presentation for another time. Um, the difference, though, in going higher and higher in your dose is you want to make sure the patient is responding as you go up on the dose and that you're not chasing tolerance. So there are some patients that will grow tolerant to doses and you keep increasing, increasing. At some point, you have to make the distinction, am I pursuing clinical legitimacy or am I now chasing a tolerance issue? And if that happens, you have to explain to the patient that they've developed a physiologic tolerance. Um, and at that point, you have to taper off or move to another preparation. In that, in, that, um, in that scenario, I would move to a different compound. So if they develop the tolerance to methylphenidate, go to uh, amphetamine uh, or vice versa, and then think about your non-stimulants as an adjunctive agent. So as you go higher on your stimulant medication, if you get to a dose at which you are growing concerned and you don't really want to go higher, but the patient is getting some response, not optimal, then think about adding a non-stimulant or an alpha-2 agonist. Will you please comment on comorbidity of ADHD and bipolar disorder disease? Sure. Come back. I'll do an hour presentation with 175 slides. This is a discussion that is um, it's just ever-present because you can't figure out is the mood lability a function of bipolar disorder or is the bipolar disorder uh, affect a, a function of emotional dysregulation and ADHD. <clears throat> what I will tell you concisely, though, is ADHD and bipolar disorder are not diagnoses as a snapshot in time. You don't make that diagnosis accurately doing that. You can do symptom checklists and say, well, you have six of nine or three of seven or whatever, but both of these disorders are distinguished by the trajectory of their symptoms and the onset of action. ADHD is anchored in childhood and early adolescence. If you didn't have these symptoms in college or high school, you don't have ADHD. Bipolar disorder has this index, and you've heard Roger McIntyre and Andy Cutler talk about this in their talks on mood disorders. Um, the index case for bipolar disorder is typically 14 to 22. The first case is typically a, a depressive episode. And then you go looking for family history. In ADHD, if you go looking for family history, especially in adults, 
uh, they may not be able to identify it because their parents were never identified as having ADHD. So you don't say, do you have ADHD in your family? Do you say, do you have parents or siblings who have a history of being inattentive, disorganized, inconsistent, and just unreliable? That's how you ask the question for family history. A lot of patients on XR preparations and a PRN IR. Can you speak to the approach and different uh, delivery systems? Sure. So if you start with Adderall XR, my typical dosing is 10 milligrams for three or four days, 20 milligrams for five to seven days, then move it up to 30 milligrams. I write it as a 10 milligram prescription. That way, as you're moving up on the dose, if the patient gets to a dose that's uncomfortable, they have the option of backing it down. That way you'll know how they're responding. Your dose range for adults on, on mixed amphetamine salt XR is anywhere between 20 milligrams and 60 by, um, FD, by the uh, insurance established max, but I, I go higher, 80 milligrams, 100 milligrams. Um, the IR, it's interesting. This, this idea of long acting in the morning and then a booster in the afternoon is really a prescription practice by child psychiatry. So you'd have the kid get the morning medicine. Let's say back in the day they were using IR, so they got IR at 7 o'clock. Then they went to the nursing station at 12 o'clock. They got the IR at 12 o'clock. And then at 4 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, the parent had the decision. Do I want to deal with my kid unmedicated during dinner, or do I want to medicate my kid at 4 o'clock? Now, who's going to medicate their kid at 4 o'clock? It's the kid who's disruptive. If the kid is not disruptive, the kid doesn't get the 4 o'clock medicine. And that's because mom and the parents are concerned I'm giving my kid too much of this toxic medication. So that's also another issue. And the, and the other thing about medications is there's a meaning to medication. If you simply think that your, your uh, role here is to write a prescription, give it to the patient, have the patient take it compliantly, you're missing the boat here. You have to understand why patients are taking their medication. Why do you take your medicine in the morning? Well, because I want my day to go smoothly. The quality of life issue. People say, do you have to be on medicine for the rest of my life because I'm going to have ADHD for the rest of my life? I say, I don't know. What quality of life do you want? Bring it back to the quality of life because it's an inarguable point. I don't need my glasses. I could, I could walk around all day without my glasses, and that would be fine, except I wouldn't be able to identify anybody. It's the same thing with the medication. What quality of life do you want to function at? And then leave that to the patient. See, the patient's in control of their illness. You're an educator, you're a provider. You don't tell the patient to do anything. They don't have to follow your recommendations. But you're a better clinician if you understand why they take the medicine and reframe it as a quality of life issue. So in regards to the IR, I got distracted. Um, what I typically do will go up on the XR in the morning, go up on the long acting, and see if you can get a longer duration of action. For every 10 milligrams of mixed amphetamine salt XR, Increase. I get about an hour and a half or two hours out of that. Do I have a research publication to show you that? I don't. Clinical experience. But move up on your morning dose because sometimes you'll get the morning dose to extend out to 5 o'clock and then they don't need to take that dose at 2 o'clock and interrupt their work day because they're only taking it about 50% of the time anyway. Oh, can you speak to dosing clients using um, high potency THC? Well, since I took my gummy this morning, I can, I can speak to it. That's why I'm particularly funny this morning. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. All kidding aside. Uh, marijuana, marijuana is an issue now because of the uh, recreational use and its legality. You can get THC, THC, CBD. Um, there's really not any good research on its effect in ADHD. There's a lot of growing. Re uh, research showing increased rates of uh, depression, amotivation, psychosis, uh, things like that. You have to keep in mind that the current marijuana is not your father's marijuana. The THC levels are four to five, six fold higher now. One puff will set off your cerebral rockets. It used to be back in the day. You smoked a whole joint. It was a recreational activity. Now it's not a recreational activity. Now it's like, just get me high. It's a whole different ball of wax. So I counsel my ADHD folks about their marijuana use. Now, do I get bent out of shape if you're vaping a couple of times, two, three times a week? Not really. But if you're starting in the morning or the afternoon and you're doing it every day, we, we've got a problem. And the stimulant medication may counterbalance the amotivation of THC, <clears throat> but you know, it's like 
putting the fire out while somebody else is pouring gasoline on it. It just doesn't work well. We running out of questions? I've got 20 seconds left. Okay, so let me tell you some other stories. I had a teacher with ADHD teaching a class. Johnny was acting up. Johnny, go sit in the back of the class. You got 15 minutes, put your nose in the corner, and I'll get back to you. 15 minutes later, she's on with her class, and she notices Johnny sitting in the corner and goes, ah, I cannot remember why I put that kid there. <laughs> teacher has ADHD, right? So she asks Johnny, so she turns Johnny around and she says, Johnny, have you thought about what you did? Yes, Mrs. Johnson. Are you ever going to do it again? No, Mrs. Johnson. Can you explain to the class what you did? And now I can remember what you did. <laughs> These are all true stories. Here's an inspirational story. Inspirational story. I was seeing this kid, he's 25 years old. He was working as a metal shop factor, a metal shop worker in a factory. We put him on his medication for ADHD. He's doing really well at work. He's doing so well, he's getting bored. His dad notices he's doing really well. Why don't you come work for me? I'll give you some jobs and just blah, 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 blah. Long story short, three years later, he is now overseeing a medical billing company with revenues in excess of $10 million. Three-year change. Metal sheet worker, a $22.50 an hour, overseeing a company with $10 plus million in revenue. If you don't think that that is transformational in somebody's life, then you'll have to come up with a better story than that. And with that, I will stop. I thank you for your attention.